How much longer will the post office victims wait the government scramble to get justice? With public clamour showing no sign of calming tonight, the business minister told Parliament proposals to overturn criminal convictions and sought compensation are his highest priority. We have devised some options for resolving the outstanding criminal convictions with much more pace. It follows Rishi Sunak saying he would strongly support the Honours Committee reviewing the CBE awarded to the former post office boss Paula Venels. She have has been following the story, which has only grown since the ITV drama was broadcast. Also tonight. The desperate diplomatic push to stop the spread of war. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrives in Israel again tonight. John Williams, the fullback. Oh, he turned well, and he did it. The sporting world in mourning with the death of two icons, rugby legend JPR Williams and German football hero Franz Beckenbauer. How to keep kids in school? The Education Secretary extends a new mentoring scheme to tackle persistent absences. But is it enough? And... Five, four, three, we have ignition. After a smooth takeoff, the big technical hitch, which could threaten the first US mission to the moon in 50 years. This is ITV News at 10 with Julie Etchingham. Good evening. Rare is political consensus, rarer still in an election year. But on the post office IT scandal, it seems all sides are agreed. The victims have suffered appallingly and not least for their sake, justice needs at long last to be done. Delivering it, said the post office minister tonight, is his highest priority. Kevin Hollenrake revealed that plans to right the historic wrongs are expected from the government soon. They cannot come soon enough, though, for those caught up in it all. More than 700 sub-postmasters and mistresses have received criminal convictions. The pace to overturn them, too slow, the minister admits. Far quicker, the speed with which the whole sorry saga has galvanised the public following last week's ITV drama. Since its broadcast, more than a million have joined the calls to strip former boss Paula Venels of her CBE, a review the Prime Minister says he would strongly support that the losses must have been caused by Mr Castleton's own error. It is this ITV drama that has thrust the plight of innocent sub-postmasters and mistresses back into the public eye. Wrongfully convicted, many having their lives ruined because of errors within a computer accounting system. Despite knowing of the scandal for years, the publicity from this show has led to government meetings and a business minister taking to the Commons today. The post of his scandal is one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our nation's history. We have devised some options for resolving the outstanding criminal convictions with much more pace. In 1999, the Post Office began the rollout of its new computer accounting system, Horizon, developed by Fujitsu. Within weeks, sub-postmasters, including Alan Bates, reported problems. There were more than 100 prosecutions based on 40 Horizon data in three years. In 2009, Alan Bates and other victims of the scandal set up the Justice for Sub-Postmasters Alliance. Between 1999 and 2015, more than 700 post office branch managers were given criminal convictions for fraud and theft. Just 93 of these have been overturned. Last year, the government said that those who've had their convictions quashed would be offered £600,000 in a full and final settlement. Only 30 have received that amount. Today, the Prime Minister, without giving any specifics, was adamant the government would work at speed to rectify this. Now, what we are now looking at is how can we speed all of that up? Right? Understandably, we will, and I'm very clear, want to get that out the door as quickly as possible. There are legal processes that have, people have had to go through. But... He also said he would support a review into whether the former post office boss Paula Venels should be stripped of her CBE because of this. A move Ed Davey, the Liberal Democrat leader, agrees with. He was postal affairs minister in the coalition government and at the time initially refused to meet with Alan Bates, the campaigner trying to expose the scandal when he first contacted him. Do you regret not meeting with the victims at first opportunity? I wish I'd known then what we all know now, 
the post office was lying on an industrial scale to me and other ministers. And when I met uh, Alan Bates and listened to his concerns, I put those concerns to the officials in my department, to the post office, to the National Federation of Postmasters. It has been a painful experience for many, including Senepathy, who as a sub-postmaster was convicted and sentenced to three years in prison when the Horizon system showed money missing from his post office. For him, justice doesn't come in the form of compensation. I'm 68 years old. Maybe another two years I live. So prior to that, my name got to be cleared. Like me, there are so many elderly postmasters, postmistresses there. Their name to, got to be cleared for them to go and live in the society without any, any black mark on them. Some postmasters were exonerated in 2021, but there are plenty of others waiting to have this experience and feel this sense of relief that they deserve. And Shihab joins me now. And so it's clear that they say they're looking at ways of speeding up uh, the methods of overturning all these wrongful convictions. What is holding up the pace when these people are, are so desperate? It's been communicated so thoroughly now, hasn't it? Yeah, it, as is often the case with these things, it is slightly complicated. The Justice Secretary held some meetings today to discuss it. We understand that there are going to be more meetings that he's holding with senior figures within the judiciary. This isn't because of a lack of willingness. I understand the number 10's position on this is that they want to see these convictions overturned and they want to see it happen as soon as possible. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There are some calling for a blanket measure that would overturn all these convictions immediately. But legal experts are telling us the issue with that is it would raise question marks over judicial independence. There's a big question of ethics here. Can politicians, can parliament really intervene in an independent judicial system and what would that mean for our democracy if they do and that's why these meetings are taking place and that's why the justice secretary and the government is looking at a number of different options with that end goal in mind to get these overturned as quickly as possible but to do so in a way that wouldn't cause any issues they're going to explore several different um, avenues they're talking to experts to find out the best way to do it ultimately for these victims it can't come soon enough these convictions have a huge impact not only on what they've been through but also on things like getting loans getting visas they have an, an impact day to day so this needs to happen as soon as possible and all of those mps know how much the public is watching this very closely now okay she had thank you very much indeed for that thank you the US Secretary of State has arrived in Israel tonight, his latest stop on his latest Middle East mission. It is his fourth in three months, the desperate hope that violence in the region might still be contained through diplomacy. But even today, there was more evidence of how the war extends beyond Gaza's boundaries. A senior commander of the Iranian-backed terror group Hezbollah was killed in southern Lebanon this morning. Security officials there say Israeli airstrikes were responsible. Every airstrike is a roll of the dice. Every death designed to warn also risks provocation. In this car, a senior Hezbollah commander was killed today, Wazim al Tawil, a field general in Hassan Nasrallah's elite military unit, directing operations against Israel from Lebanon. It may only serve to incite another escalation. <laughs> The Israeli Prime Minister visited his troops on the northern border. We showed Hezbollah what happened to its friends in the south, he said. We will do everything necessary for security here. Much of the world has watched in horror what is happening in the south. Today, Israel declared the one working hospital in central Gaza to be in a combat zone. Many staff fled in fear. The World Health Organization calls it a medical and moral outrage. Um, they are seeing, in some cases, hundreds of casualties every day in a small emergency department. Uh, yesterday they said they had one doctor working overnight in this emergency department with hundreds, in some cases, of casualties coming in on a daily basis. In the north of Gaza, Israel claims to have now defeated Hamas. But elsewhere, where there are hundreds and thousands of civilians sheltering, the fighting is as intense as ever. Even this country's allies accuse Israel of making many plans for war, but none for peace. Somehow, Antony Blinken must chart a path to de-escalation. 
he is helped a little by what Israel calls a new strategy in Gaza. When even your closest ally, the United States, says too many innocent men, women and children are being killed by Israel, does that not at least give you pause? We will win this. We have no choice. And I think we will be moving more into counterinsurgency and counterterrorism, less to full-scale uh, battle, the uh, sort of thing we've seen up until now. And I think with that, you'll see the number of uh, civilian uh, casualties go right down. And hopefully we'll be getting more and more Hamas killers. Tonight, Hamas launched a huge salvo of rockets towards Israel. Some were intercepted over Tel Aviv. The war, Israel warns, will continue for many months. And we can speak now to John, who's in Tel Aviv tonight. And I don't think it's any, any underestimation, really. Every time uh, Anthony Blinken flies into the region, his job becomes harder, appears harder. Yeah, that's right, Julie. And I think that killing in Lebanon today is indicative of the United States' lack of control over the course of this war, lack of control over Israel's uh, conduct of the war. You might remember right at the very beginning of this, Joe Biden came to Israel and he warned Israel, look, be aware of the mistakes America made in the wake of 9-11. In other words, be cautious. It is only today that the government here is talking about scaling back the intensity of its offensive uh, in Gaza. And I doubt it feels that very that way in Gaza tonight to the people under attack. And at the same time, Israel seems intent in pushing Hezbollah as far as they possibly can in the north. Nevertheless, uh, Mr. Blinken is in the country tonight. He says he's a man with a plan to scale back the intensity of this war to get aid into Gaza. And he concluded his remarks before he arrived here saying uh, there is a way to chart a practical path to a Palestinian state. He then added that these t talks will be tough. That, Julie, is massive diplomatic understatement. John, thank you very much indeed. And there is more from John on our flagship podcast. He told me what you need to know about the possible next steps for Israel's offensive. You can find that episode now on our website or wherever you get your podcasts. The deaths of two sporting giants were announced this evening, each remembered for their talent on the pitch and for leading their nations to generational greatness. Later, we'll hear the tributes to football's Franz Beckenbauer, but first to a rugby union icon whose name instantly transports fans back to the sitting rooms of the 1970s, where his name rang out from sporting commentators on the TV, known simply as JPR. JPR Williams, the Welshman, became an icon with those three initials, a pair of sideburns and that one classic drop goal. This is John Williams now. Can John Williams score his third try against England? Yes, he can. His was one of the greatest names among so many legendary Welsh players who dominated rugby union in the 70s. John Peter Rees Williams was an attacking fullback whose long strides regularly evaded desperate tackles as he rushed for the try line. JPR Williams, the fullback, scores the try. He made his international debut at just 19 and went on to win 55 caps for his country. But at a time when even international rugby players were amateurs, rugby was only a part-time job. He was an orthopaedic surgeon by training and mixed healing patients with causing carnage on the rugby pitch. Occasionally, his professional expertise was called upon to help treat injured teammates. A fierce competitor, maybe the most competitive rugby man I've ever met in my life. You know, even he went on to play late on in his, you know, in his 40s and I think maybe the 50s for his local club, Saitondi. Um, but, you know, it's, his side burns and his socks roll down. Um, you know, you can just see him you now running on to the, to the arms park and just performing as, as he usually did, you know, absolutely magnificent. John Williams, the fullback. He played vital roles in some of the most illustrious wins by the British and Irish Lions. This drop goal secured a series victory over the All Blacks. And when New Zealand came looking for revenge against many of the same players wearing barbarian shirts two years later, he scored a try in what's remembered as one of the greatest ever games. He was a promising enough tennis player to have won at Wimbledon, but preferred to stick to rugby and play on a Welsh side that won three Grand Slams and four Triple Crowns. 
JPR Williams played against England 11 times, scoring five tries and was never on the losing side. In announcing his death at the age of 74, his club Bridge End said he was an icon of world rugby. Ian Woods, News at 10. He sure was. Now, the issue of Britain's school children skipping class has become about far than a few more than a few cases of occasional truancy. A poll suggests one in five pupils are now persistently absent, in other words, missing one day of school each fortnight. A drive to cut that number was launched today by the Education Secretary, but she admitted to Rachel new funding and ways to share best practice are only part of the solution. Hi, hello. In her home city of Liverpool, at a school forced to employ their own self-funded attendance officer, the Education Secretary revealed how the government will further tackle pupil absence. Most people don't really know what a Secretary of State does, right? Gillian Keegan says attendance hubs will double and up to £15 million will be made available to extend the current mentor programme. It'll reach around 10,000 persistently absent children. Almost two million pupils are persistently absent from schools, so this doesn't really touch the surface, does it? That's why I say it's not, it's not the only thing. It's part of a whole range of things that we're doing. So Teachers have told me that they want feet on the ground, they want extra staff in school and they need the funding. Well, the mental health support teams are also extra staff that are supporting schools with mental health. And local authorities, many local authorities, have people who are responsible for attendance. The announcement came as a Centre for Social Justice poll revealed a third of parents don't believe it's essential for their children to attend school every day. And some say it's not an option. Sophia's daughter has ADHD and says school triggers devastating anxiety. We had times where I'd be driving her to school and she'd be saying to me, I just want to jump off the roof of that building, Mum. But obviously, at that point, you're told they must go to school. The reality of it is, is that they don't need to. And it's actually more catastrophic for their mental health to go to school than not. At St Christopher's, staff work daily to drive up attendance, often on top of their teaching roles. Finding the staff who've got the time to do that, to make those phone calls, daily phone calls, to make those home visits is a challenge. And would that for you be more key than perhaps these hubs? I think what happens in school makes the most difference. Tomorrow, Labour will say if in power, they'll work to reset the broken relationship between schools and families. The current government's plans won't be rolled out until September. The Tories may not even be in government in nine months' time. Well, a lot can happen in politics in a week, as they say, and certainly a lot can happen in nine months. And will you still be in power? Well, I very much, I love this job, and it's, you know, it's been a real privilege to be the Secretary of State for Education, or as somebody described me earlier today, the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate head teacher. And this could be her ultimate challenge. Rachel Townsend, News at 10, Liverpool. Putting aside the simple miracle that no one was hurt in Friday's Boeing jet blowout, the aviation industry is wasting no time in investigating what went wrong. For now, attention is focusing on concerns previously raised about pressure warnings. They'd led to a decision restricting the aircraft from undertaking long flights over water. And tonight, another airline, United Airlines, has found loose bolts on its now-grounded 737 Maxes. Despite a gaping hole in the fuselage, there was little outward sign of panic among the passengers. Oxygen masks had deployed as the cabin pressure had plunged. The lights then dimmed during the rapid descent, leaving people a view of the approaching city framed by a hole in their aircraft. Radio traffic from the cockpit gives a sense of the unfolding drama. Once safely on the ground, the extent of the damage was clear. The seats next to the hole were both empty. The passengers allocated them had missed their flight. We are very, very fortunate here that this didn't end up in something more tra uh, tragic. Passengers leaving the flight in Portland recalled the moment their aircraft was ripped open. I look up and the oxygen masks were hanging from the ceiling. 
And then I look to my left and there's this huge chunk, part of the airplane, just like missing. One of the guys that was there, his shirt was sucked out and his phone was sucked out. Went to go for a walk today and found... That phone was found in Portland, still working and displaying a baggage receipt for the flight. And, uh, I found a phone sitting on the side of the road that uh, had apparently fallen 16,000 feet. The panel, known as a door plug, which blew out, has also been recovered. It will now be the focus for investigators who've been told cabin pressure warning lights repeatedly went off on the plane. They will be working with Boeing and with their suppliers to look at the specific installation of this particular plug, uh, the engineering that went into that, and determine the cause of this. They have found the plug already, so that is a very important step. The airline industry is trying to minimise the impact on travellers by switching to other aircraft, while the 737 MAX 9s are briefly grounded for inspection. But even so, there have been hundreds of delays and cancellations, and Boeing's share price has fallen sharply. Boeing 737 MAX aircraft were involved in two crashes in Indonesia in October 2018, and four months later in Ethiopia, after a problem with the autopilot. Now, once again, the safety of this plane is being closely scrutinised. Mid reports loose bolts on door plugs have been found on other 737 MAX aircraft with a similar seat layout. Dam Rivers, News at 10, in the United States. Now, even without the involvement of Idris Elba, those returning to Westminster today could hardly have missed the sobering demonstration mounted on Parliament Square. Row upon row of neatly folded clothes representing those killed in the scourge of knife crime on the streets of Britain. The hope, as Mr Elba put it, was to jog the focus of MPs. He wants machetes and so-called zombie knives to be banned with immediate effect. What these teenagers have in common is that they were all stabbed to death last year. What their families have left of them are photographs and clothes and shoes. Joining them in Westminster today, a famous actor who can explain why both he and they are here. I'm a parent, I'm, I'm, I'm a parent. I'm not an actor that's standing right now. I'm, I'm, I have children. This symbol here of the actual clothes of some of the victims of knife crime right under the noses of Parliament should jog their focus on what can we do. But it's not the first time he's tried to do that. In 2019, he told ITV News the government needed to do more as he gave his support to a knife amnesty on the streets of London. But five years on, he's come to Parliament because he claims nothing has changed. The government has promised an outright ban on these so-called zombie knives, but Elba and other campaigners say it needs to happen now. Today I've brought um, Andre's rucksack, which he had on his back when he was um, running away from the guys that killed him. Seven years after her own son was stabbed to death, Yemi is still watching other families go through the same pain. It hurts. I actually cry. I, it, it really affects us. So. You know, we need this to stop. The government says hospital admissions for knife injuries are down, but teenagers are still dying. Most recently, 16-year-old Harry Pittman, who was murdered on New Year's Eve. It's heartbreaking, you know, you, when you really think about it, while the rest of our society were having a great time, there was someone that had to knock on the door and say to a mother of that child that, listen, that child won't be coming home today. Senselessly murdered. On Friday night, Harry's team Tottenham Hotspur paid tribute to him with a minute's applause. On Sunday, Arsenal players wore white as part of its own anti-knife crime campaign. Can't take it no more. And today, Idris Elba has released a song called Knives Down. He hopes it's one that politicians will listen to. Chloe Keedy, Music 10. 
any footballer playing in a World Cup is the pinnacle of a sporting career. Only the luckiest find themselves in the final and then on the winning team. Franz Beckenbauer, whose death was announced today, achieved that rarest feat. He was one of just three men to have won a World Cup, both as a player and as a manager. Little wonder the man who led West Germany to repeated success is regarded as one of the all-time greats. Germany called Franz Beckenbauer the Kaiser, the Emperor, because of his elegant style and leadership skills. In a nation passionate about football, he was one of its greatest ever players. His leadership qualities saw him captain West Germany to World Cup glory in 1974, but also managed them to victory in 1990. They got great players like him, the Kaiser, and they won it. And that's what I remember more than anything about it, is how good they were and he was. Obviously, I'll back up what the lads have said there. Great player, great ambassador for football. And a sad day, of course. He played in the 1966 World Cup final, marking Sir Bobby Charlton. It was a day Beckenbauer may have wished to forget after England's victory, but he won the award for the tournament's best young player. Four decades later, he reflected on those memories. Bobby mentioned this uh, uh, game 66, the World Cup final, and at this time Bobby was the best player in the world, and I was young, as you could see on the picture, 21 years old, black hair. It's a long time ago, huh, Bobby? Yeah. As manager, he saw Germany break England's hearts on penalties in Italia 90 before going on to win the tournament. Tonight, Bayern Munich, who he played for 582 times, said, rest in peace, Emperor Franz. We will never forget what you have done for football in Germany. Franz Beckenbauer, whose death at the age of 78 was announced this evening. And finally, if you're watching on Friday, you may recall the story about the British-built scientific instruments due to head to the moon today. They were aboard the Peregrine Lunar Lander, America's first such mission in more than 50 years. Things started pretty well with the blast-off from Cape Canaveral first thing this morning, but just after lunchtime, a so-called anomaly was detected. And you don't need to be a rocket scientist to realise that spelled bad news. Five, four, three... We have ignition. It had all started so well. A flawless launch from Florida. And liftoff, launching a new era in spaceflight to the moon and beyond. Propelling a private rocket loaded with NASA equipment towards the moon. Yeehaw! I am so thrilled, I can't tell you how much. Oh my gosh, this has been years of hard work. So far, this has been an absolutely beautiful mission. This was the last time NASA carried out a controlled lunar landing, Apollo 17, 51 years ago. Now they want to take astronauts back to the moon, perhaps as a training base ahead of a mission to Mars. And for a longer stay, they'll need to monitor radiation and ideally find a water supply. That's what Kit on board the Peregrine is designed to do. But space exploration is expensive, so in comes the private sector splitting the cost with companies delivering things like robots and, believe it or not, the DNA and ashes of famous people, including former presidents and the creator of Star Trek. We have ignition, both rust, everything looking good. This afternoon, the team reported an anomaly. The solar panel wasn't pointing towards the sun. With the battery nearly flat, the team improvised a manoeuvre. The battery recharged but there's been a critical loss of propellant, causing the damage shown here, leaving the team searching for a plan B. If this mission does fail, people might say, well, that's a big failure for NASA. Actually, that's not the case. The reason that they have um, contracted commercial companies is they're trying to stimulate a lunar economy. They're paying less than if NASA was to develop a single mission of their own, but they're actually accepting a higher risk profile. Today's flight may not land, but it has fired the starting pistol on a new space race. India made it to the moon in August. Now teams and companies from America, Russia, China, Japan and Israel plan to do the same this year, laying claim to the moon and the minerals it contains. Martin Stew, News at 10. 
And that is it for tonight. Thanks for staying up. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night.